I'm Maggie Wilkinson, CEO of Athena Global Advisors, and welcome to Jolty. Proven futurists and longtime friends and collaborators, Faith Popcorn and Adam Hampt will take center stage to discuss and debate everything from COVID to comfort to marketing to mindset. And now, Adam, over to you. Thanks, Maggie. So I'm really thrilled to be here with Faith, who is probably my oldest friend, personal friend, and business friend. And there really isn't much to be said about Faith that hasn't been said already, so I'll do my best uh, in that context. Faith really invented this notion of futurism but long before anybody was looking forward and thinking about the consequences of what's happening at the moment. She did that. She helped Fortune 500 CEOs plan for a future and get their heads out of their PowerPoints and get their heads out of the moment. So for us to be sitting here virtually today to talk about the future, having written Dictionary of the Future together is really, is really an inspiring moment for me. Um, I can think of nobody better to partner with to begin our first podcast with than Faith. That was lovely. Um, Addie, as he said, I call him Addie, and everybody can if they want to, but uh, he is a very, very dear friend of mine. And what Adam really is great at is applying futurism. He's done it in branding. He's done it creatively. He's done it in marketing. He's done it on the internet. He's done it entrepreneurially, started many companies. He's worked for and with industry leading companies. He's also a very wonderful board member, Lucky Scotts. He's on the board of Scotts Miracle Grow and then 1 800 Flowers. So, between gardening and cannabis and gifting, he really is watching how consumers are expressing their happiness, but right now their fears, their anxieties, their stresses. So, anyway, I am thrilled to be here with you, Addie. We've been talking for about 200 centuries about this, and it's going to be fantastic. That was lovely, too, and uh, some nice little jolts in there for me. Thank you. Faith and Adam, why Jolty? How did you you come up with the name Jolty? My God, how many names did we look at? (laughs) Hundreds and hundreds of names. It was worth it. It was. It was. It was. I love Jolty because for me, it's the lighthearted side of being electrocuted. I mean, like, we've been killed here, and but it's a joke, but it's also infused us with kind of energy and imagination. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. We're branders, so we love, yeah. love to take a word and then give it a little bit of a twist so it's familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. Yeah. Jolts can be scary, but when you add the diminutive Y, it becomes a little friendlier and more accessible. So we love that part of it also, as my wife said, it could become a verb, which we can say, hey, Faith, that was very jolty of you. So it has the ability to work its way into the conversation as well. Absolutely. I think it can be a candy, too. It feels like a sharp, delicious, hot candy. Jolty. It does. Yeah. It's like, like the comic fireballs. Remember when we were kids? Yes. So as we were talking about what the first podcast was going to be about, I know that we talked about the fact that we're reframing our days and ways. We had rituals and routines that were in place that we used to go into the office or to do what we normally do. And really in the flip of a switch, that all turned upside down and on its head. And you all really went away and talked about it and came back and said, you know, where's my blankie is the perfect title for our first podcast. And I'd love for you just to tell us a little bit more about that and talk about that. Yeah, I think that we wanted something that was universal in this moment. And the blankie is both literal and it's a metaphor. So we all need something that we could cling to. We need ritual. Um, We need something that's going to give us some feeling of comfort, security, and an emotional sanctuary around us. And that's what the blankie is. And whether, you know, you are a billionaire who's in the hold up in the Hamptons or you are a frontline healthcare worker who takes off their clothes, throws them outside their apartment and showers when they get in, they're both looking for their blankie at this moment. And to your point, when you said a lot of people don't want to come out, you know, I think that's the iron blankie. I think that we're like putting up a, you know, it's, it's scary to be in here in a way, but it's also comfortable wanting to not peek out. 
Yeah, and I think that's also related to the whole work work at home, remote working balance too, which is I can't tell you how many people say to me, you know, I'm kind of liking this. So the dog runs by in my Zoom call. I know. That's that nice. happened. Have you noticed that, that so much more is tolerated now? I was just on a phone call earlier today and I took it with her daughter on her knee. And, you know, she had her arm around her mom's hair and was redoing it while we were, while we were talking. And I thought, it's so nice that our lives are allowed into these calls now. Yeah. The corporate veneer is gone, basically. We thought casual Fridays were so fantastic. This is casual life. I'm going to now introduce Dr. Harold Koplowitz. He is a globally known, respected um, expert in child and adolescent psychiatry. He founded the Child Mind Institute here in Manhattan, where he's both an academic and a clinician. So there's nobody better to talk about the blankie. And he's also um, the winner of an award that I found particularly inspiring, and I want to make sure I get it right. He won the Catcher in the Rye Award, which is granted by the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. So I love the fact that they named this award after Holden Caulfield sort of the avatar of adolescent angst. And they had the kind of sense of humor and humanity to do that. And we will talk with him in just a few minutes about how children and adolescents, a very troubling age and stage under any circumstances, are gravitating to the warmth and security of the blanket. So, Doug, I love him. He is my very good friend. He is the founder of Conant Leadership. He's a phenomenal expert on what makes a leader. Recently, he's written many books, but he published this beautiful book called The Blueprint, Six Practical Steps to Lift Your Leadership to New Heights, and you can find it on Amazon. He's also an internationally known New York Times bestselling author, keynote speaker, social media influencer. He's a great dad to his beautiful children and his wife, Lee. He's not her dad. He's her husband. Thank you. And CEO, and why I wanted him so much, I'm so delighted he could he could come here today. He is a, was the CEO of two blanky Fortune 200 companies. One was Campbell's Soup. What more of a blanky is to make than tomato soup and a grilled cheese sandwich? And then, of course, um, the Nabisco Company. So thanks for being here, Doug. And um, I can't wait to hear you talk about your blanky past. Let's bring on Doug and Harold. Hey Doug, how are you? Good, good. It's uh, it's good to be connecting with you guys. The, Thank my you. last my last live meeting was March fifth at Faith's house uh, <laughs> for my my book launch. There's um, nothing quite like launching a new book into the teeth of a global pandemic. Oh yeah. Well, so Faith and I know about that because we launched Dictionary of the Future a month before 9-11. We share similarly elegant timing with you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Harold. How are you? Hi, how are you? We're good. One question. It seems like there's a lot of loss right now. And and I, I know you're both seeing that. Um, Harold's been talking to me about that. You know, he's talking to kids and parents from morning till night, God bless you. And how 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 how, what surrogates are they using? I mean, what replacements? I mean, I actually feel like pulling my kid's blankie out and going to bed with it. Instead, I got a puppy. So uh, <laughs> um, my little way, way. But um, Harold, do you want to take that? So I think that um, kids are really responding in very personal ways. And sometimes when people are stressed, and I think we're all stressed by this, it's a remarkable event that can have an effect on everyone's mental health. So the way to think about mental health is that there's always a group of people, about 60% of the population, who are typically developing happy-go-lucky, they love well, they play well, everything is okay, and all of a sudden you've taken school away from them, so they feel stressed. And then you have a group of kids, around 15% of them, who are subclinical. They have symptoms, but they never have enough distress or dysfunction, and then you put this stress and strain on them, they're more symptomatic. You have 20% of the population that has a real common treatable mental health disorder. And on a good day in America, only 40% of them get treated. So you can imagine for someone with OCD or depression or with ADHD, anxiety disorder, this is an incredibly challenging time. And then 5% of the population actually has a very serious psychiatric illness, schizophrenia, some kind of psychotic process, 
uh, really they're out of touch with reality or they have low functioning autism where they don't even communicate with our language. Those individuals usually are protected from these kind of world catastrophes because they're either intellectually or emotionally not attached. And yet these individuals are also affected because the supply chain has been affected. So their medications aren't in the drugstore. Treatment centers or their social groups have been disbanded. disbanded. So you now have an entire nation, entire world, frankly, that's mental health is affected. And so the way we respond to anxiety is very different for individuals. So some of us want to eat more or want to sleep more. We want that metaphoric uh, warm blanket. There are others who get more activated. You know, they're jogging more, they're exercising more, they're on the telephone more. And then a lot of us are doing bad things. We're watching too much television. So I think that kids are responding to this in all different ways. And it's why parents all of a sudden are playing so much bigger a role than ever before because teachers, they're their nannies all of a sudden. And I think it makes sense that every parent become more structured. Let's get up in the morning at a certain time. Let's eat breakfast. Let's go for a walk. Well done. Addie? Just a, qu- a question to kind of widen out a bit. So if I had told you in September that this situation was going to happen to the extent that it has and that we'd all be yes. quarantined in an in extremis moment, would you have said that we have we would have behaved as well as we did? Would you have expected that we'd have a cultural nervous breakdown? And are you surprised when you put it all together that we have responded as well or or not? What 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 would you have said? I think it's I think I think it's a little early to tell. In most of these horrific events, it's the aftermath that is very bad. So if you go look at, you know, I'm running an independent nonprofit in children's mental health. So I've been talking to a lot of foundations about funding. Right now, they're interested in housing security, food security, vaccine development, tracers. The next wave will be mental health. And inevitably, after these terrible events, we have higher rates of depression, higher rates of anxiety, higher rates of domestic violence, more divorce, more suicide gestures, more suicide attempts, and more suicide completion. So we will see this coming down the pike. And if I think the more important question actually is, how are schools going to prepare for September? So if some of the schools are going to open, I would tell you that there's going to be a floodgate of kids coming out who have more school phobia, social anxiety, generalized anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and you're going to see greater amounts of absenteeism, uh, kids who can't concentrate as well, not because they have ADD, but because they're anxious. And now would be the time to start mitigation. Now would be the time to start figuring out what to do. In these large organizations and structures that I that I speak with and work with leaders, leaders are proxy parents. And uh, I see leaders realizing that they need to create the same kind of structure we were just talking about in their workplace because the underpinnings of the way of life as these uh, impl- associates have known, have known them, have all changed which is awkward for them because they've had systems and practices and processes to fall back on based on history. And that's all out the window now. So I see leaders struggling with the same challenges as I see parents struggling. One one of the things I've noticed um, in companies where I'm involved is that some of the traditional organizational silos that walled off the CEO and the C-suite from people um, below them, the organization have broken down. And it's really interesting to see exposure in a positive way of people who would never have their 15 minutes. And now, because new teams are being created to deal with the crisis, all of a sudden, the old hierarchical model, which was on its way to being flattened anyways, in many ways collapsing. I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Oh, the hierarchy is collapsing. It was collapsing before we started. When I started working uh, a long time ago, uh, there were two generations of of leaders, there were old white men and older white men. And the hierarchies were very clear. They were based on the World War II military models for command and control. Now we have six different generations in the workplace, half women, half men. The diversity uh, abounds. It's like a petri dish now. And the old hierarchies just can't handle it. So they're collapsing anyway. This pandemic has done an interesting thing. It's had a tremendous leveling effect. Because the CEOs 
are at home in their basement on you know, doing Zoom meetings, just like the middle managers are at home in their basement doing the same Zoom meetings. Everyone is experiencing this at the same time. And I'm seeing a tremendous leveling effect that's actually accelerating the breakdown of these, uh, of these hierarchies to a point where I think there's, in my observation, there's more collaboration going on here, more shared experience than ever before. We saw a little bit of this when, you know, I live right outside of New York, uh, but when we were, uh, when we went through 9-11, we sort of experienced that in New York and, and where I live right on the other side of the river, but the rest of the country didn't really feel it. I, I don't think quite the same way where everyone was affected by it. I see the same thing going on globally across the corporate landscape now. And I see the hierarchies crumbling. I see leaders becoming more human, more connected to this experience. I see empathy growing. I see anxiety creeping in at all levels, all the way from the top to the bottom to all stakeholders. And uh, it will be interesting to see the aftermath of this and how the corporate world or any large organization, academic or the government itself, how they respond to it. It's going to be, uh, the aftermath will be fascinating. I think we're actually on the dawn of a new age. What would you say to someone who's graduating from college or would have been graduating from college and just entering the workforce and being told, we're going to start you remotely? Well, you know what? They, they're used to living remotely. I mean, they haven't been in the office yet. You know, the paradigm we're reflecting right here is a paradigm you and I started with when we worked and we went to the office, but they haven't been going to offices for a decade. I think they're going to find their way through this more fluently and more, uh, more naturally than the managers are going to find their way through it who are trying to onboard them. I was going to say, I've been talking to heads of school and you would think that the young teachers would be having a much easier time with the online or distance learning than the seasoned teachers. And it's interesting that techno technologically, they're certainly faster and smoother with whatever they need to use, but they are having a terrible time trying to manage the class uh -huh. or make yeah. sure that the kids got the material where a seasoned teacher might not be able to figure out how to zoom in and zoom out literally, but has that touch that you get from 10 years of teaching. I think there's going to be a new kind of teacher. You can't take that teacher who's trained to sit in front of the classroom and believe me, he's being like AD, every kind of HD, and I am, my kids are. You can't expect that teacher who wasn't interesting in the first place to get on a screen and be interesting. You need props, you need videos. You need, it's not going to be that teacher. Teaching, you know, the, the teaching will change and become more interesting. Go ahead, education Annie. Is, education training is built for the classroom. We're going to have to go back to the schools that educate teachers and reframe it from the beginning. Make them actors. They need performance skills. They do, and they're terrible. They're awful. Yeah. The other, the other depressing side of it, because I'm a bit of an optimist. I'm not an optimist. The data shows that. I'm a futurist. When you graduate, that's true. That you're agnostic. <laughs> The data shows that when you graduate in a recession, we've not seen one like this. It could take 15 years or even more for, catch up. for the numbers to catch up. That's really yeah. a serious impact on our economy. Yeah. And the emotional state of those people who had the bad fortune to be graduating into this incredible vortex. My, I was going to say, my kids are on Fortnite. My little one, she's 15. Like, I can't even pull her off. I have such guilt that I don't know what to do with her. I'm a little happy that she's not going out getting, you know, in any kind of trouble, but still she's still on Fortnite. I'm telling you, they have a life in Fortnite. Their life is not in their homes. It's not in this, don't even say online, in this neighborhood, this place that's outside. And really smart marketers are starting to market right into Fortnite, right into Animal Crossing. I think about this generation and think that they were toddlers when 9-11 happened, and then they were in middle school when uh, the financial crisis occurred, and, and now they're finishing college, and um, we have this. It's, it's, I think yeah. it'll be very interesting to see what they are like as adults. 
I agree with that. But then my grandparents uh, went through uh, World War I, the, the Spanish flu pandemic, the Depression, World War II, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and created the greatest generation. And our kids, unfortunately, have to sit home and sit on the couch. I, I don't mean to. No, it's, it's, a, it's a very telling point. I had a, a college senior recently say to me, you know, gosh, my, my great grandfather fought in World War I on the trenches and I'm being asked to watch Netflix. I don't know. It doesn't seem that bad. <laughs> <laughs> but it's stressful. I, I mean, it's very stressful. This is, has been a huge problem already because as technology has exploded, it's created incredibly stressful work environments, right? People are getting overwhelmed by emails, text messages, phone calls, meetings, trying to keep up, trying to do more, better, faster with inadequate supervision, inadequate leadership. We're finding it playing out in an unhealthy way in the workplace, just like our kids are playing out in an unhealthy way at times in school or at home. So I think this whole notion of uh, the fragility of the American psyche going through this is very real. That will happen, I agree. And that, I think, could help destigmatize whatever mental health becomes. You know, I, was, I, I remember when the deaths were creeping up 40, 50,000. And when it hit 50,000, I said to my wife, you know, it just passed the number of people who commit suicide every year. 48,000 roughly commit suicide every year. And she was shocked. And whenever I say this to people, they were shocked. They're shocked. But I think that this could be a catalytic factor to really finally bring it out of the closet. I've waged from some really substantial American corporations to make this their issue because it really hasn't happened yet. There's been fits and starts, but nothing in a full-throated, serious way to make this something that the country should care about. It is going to come forward and be more talked about, and it is going to be supported, I believe, by the corporate community. So this is both for you, for, for, for Doug and for Harold. I've been reading a bit about how virtual meetings really disadvantage introverts and a lot of women. And that even though there are work, at this no pun intended, at the same time, the nature of these kinds of conversations advantage some kind of personality types, extroversion, I would think, and disadvantage others. So how do we cope with that as a as business? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I take, I, I've taken the Myers-Briggs test five times. And I just, you know, if, and I'm an introvert. And, hoping for a different outcome, right? Yeah, you know, I'm always hoping for every introvert wants to be an extrovert at least once. <laughs> and and I'm no different. But uh, this is a very real issue. I think Susan Cain stumbled upon it in a big way with her Quiet Revolution book. And uh, and Susan is a lovely, a lovely introvert, a corporate attorney who was in her office all the time doing her work and said, there's just got to be more conversation on this subject. And she created a whole movement. And her perspective is that half of the associates in a company are not being heard because they're introverts. And the biggest untapped resource in a company are the introverts. And so she's championing ways to hear them. We have a long way to go on that. And this is going to push it back further because uh, these Zoom meetings, uh, unless they're incredibly well-structured, and we're not very proficient at them yet as a society, uh, these Zoom meetings are in, inadequately structured and you don't hear, the introverts won't be heard. And why women? Why women, Adam? Because generally in male-dominated cultures, which, which most are women are more reluctant to speak up under the best of circumstances. But I, I kind of do my own little test. I look at the thumbnails when I'm in meetings and I can see a woman may try to start one or two times and after that, when they're spoken over, they just retreat. So... I think I think this model. Yeah, is, and they can go to they can take their picture off, you know, and just go to mute, and that's it. What do you think, Harold, about women not and introverts? That's true. I don't know. The You're not an well. introvert, Harold. By the way, what? You're not. I, an I, I am not an introvert. No. I, I'm. I am struggling with this uh, pandemic. This is very challenging, and I think that's the flip side where the social isol social isolation for older people who you know are really staying inside. Uh, people who are prone to depression, um, the anxiety that you get of staying in that bubble of watching bad news again and again um, is really, it's bad for your mental health. And forcing yourself to get up in the morning and shower, exercise, or do your routine 
can become harder and harder. This really feels like a muddy marathon that, you know, every week you just keep to keep pushing forward because something else is, is popping up, whether it's bad economy or uh, a death of acquaintance or a friend. So th this is going to take a resilience and an endurance that's very different than another kind of crisis. It feels more like when people describe the depression, you know, the economic depression, that they couldn't, there was no quick fix. You couldn't get out of it. This, that has that sense about it. And, and that takes a different kind of resilience. I agree with how 100%. This is like a, a world looking for a blankie. And it just seems like, where's my blankie? Do I eat it? Do I drink it? Do I snuggle with it? What is my blankie? Where is it? Do you all find that you've, um, I find that I have friends and colleagues who call who, who fess up to more than they might have in the past. You know, a friend who says, We're, we uh, are going out late at night and dispersing our wine bottles down the street in the recycling bins. But I feel like there's a sort of a silver lining of willingness for people to sort of fess up to their humanity and um, they're, they're struggling to cope with this a little bit more than maybe in the past. So the flip side is that there's certain people who are having the time of their lives. I take care of a 19-year-old boy who has Asperger's who literally said to me, I've been waiting for this my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> I get to stay inside. I don't talk to anyone I don't want to talk to. I have food delivered. I stay up all night if I want to, playing Fortnite or play, doing something else. And I think to myself that introverts clearly would have an easier time or people who are socially anxious, who do feel pathologically self-conscious, um, but, and, and there's certain people who are just, are, you know, I, I keep thinking that some people come out and look like an Adonis and some people come out with 20 pounds heavier because the only social distancing I should do is with my refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got to say, I do think introverts are built uh, to deal with this. I also agree with the observation that there's more humanity and more candor. I'm seeing it in the workplace. And all these Zoom meetings, people are sharing their real life stories mm -hmm. with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it, regardless of level or anything else, they're saying, you wouldn't believe what happened with my kids this morning. And the first thing they do for a Zoom meeting is they'll go around the table and talk about, you know, what's the latest in your household? It becomes a, a warmer, safer, more trust promoting space if we can get to a place where we can have this kind of candor and humanity and this willingness to share a bit more. Well, hopefully they can remember. Yeah, well, I, I hope. Are we going to pick our group? You know, we have a trend called planning, but are we going to pick a group that we want to weather this storm with? Or the group is picked for us by the context, too. Maybe. Like what? Like, like people who have the immune passport, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. true. Yeah, people, we, like we're hearing, you know, you hear from old friends, you start to, like, oh, I right. even like the people I don't like. <laughs> you know, I like <laughs> almost everybody, but I'm so dying to asking anybody around here, like, anybody want to come over, have a drink, anything? I get a few stragglers. Like, it's really bad for an extrovert. So, you know, the Depression never really ended. It just went into World War II, right? So we didn't, we didn't really have a historical framework because we never really came out of the Depression. It was, still, it was World War II that brought us out. Then everything ended with World War II. The economy exploded. Everybody was united. The GIs came back, GI Bill, all of that. So how do you guys think about how we will emotionally m emerge from this? Will there be coming together, or are we just going to break into smaller and smaller shards as this resolves? Well, the, so far, it doesn't look good. It, you know, that there are people who don't believe in coronavirus and it has something to do with their political beliefs. I, I just hope we just don't split into. I, this should be the thing that unites us right now. It's not making me feel that way. So, you know, I, I claim to be a clear eyed optimist. But on this subject, I'm not that optimistic because we were a highly fragmented culture to begin with. And now we're adding a whole new layer of stress to it that's affecting every one of us deeply and personally. And it, it's, I, I fear it's gonna pull us farther apart as we get more, more deeply into our positions. And uh, so we, we have a shared experience, which could be helpful, but uh, there's a real risk here that we could just be pouring accelerant 
onto a highly diverse contrarian society right now. Are there lessons learned? And I worry that we haven't learned anything. So um, that, that's the trouble because we live in a dangerous time. And let's say this was manufactured in the lab and maybe you know, there's a conspiracy that this was done on purpose. Well, how do we prepare ourselves for the next time around? And I don't know if we've done anything to, to get ourselves ready. What I hear from people in the healthcare community is forgetting the timing. The, a big issue was the was and is the lack of a f- orchestrated, well coordinated federal response. Federal response, pushing it down to the state level. So you had hospitals bidding against each other as opposed to coordinating the delivery of the healthcare supplies that were necessary. And of course, our refusal to deal with our us, America's refusal to deal with reality and to kick the can down the road is universal to party. You know, look at our infrastructure, look at a lot of other issues. So I think a failure to fund a response and stockpiles and all of that, I think rests on both parties. I have found this absolutely fascinating. I mean, so fantastic. I really appreciate the two of you, my friends, for coming on. And I'm so honored to have you there for this kickoff. I really appreciate it. It's going to be fantastic. And Addie, did you want to add anything? No, I just think it's been it's been great. There's, you know, Faith and I were talking about what this inaugural episode would be, and this really exceeded our expectations in terms of the the vitality and the depth of the conversation. So you guys come from different disciplines, but you sh- you have a lot in common, sort of emotionally, EQ-wise. So it was great to be able to put you together. Yeah, you guys should get together. I'll the be next here. time, next time, Faith, I'd like you to serve booze. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. problem. I will toast you. Thank on you. The next on the next one. And yeah. we also like we Faith, also like blankies. <laughs> All right, angels. Thank you so much. So I'm going to let Doug and Harold go. Uh, bye. 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 Thank you. How adorable are they? Yeah. This has been incredible. It's been a real jolt to my system and to my happiness. I have to say, Adam Hamd, it was the most wonderful thing to share this with you. And of course, Maggie Wilkinson of Athena, you are brilliant and it was lovely and you really inspired us to push this along and actually get it done. And then, of course, without my chief of staff, Kathleen Cantwell, and then Ashley Wells and Jill Lippman. Thank you so much. You are literally behind these squares, but you are everything to our success in Schulte. So I appreciate it so much. And I will, and Adam will, and you, Maggie, will see you in the future. See you in the future. Bye-bye. See you and hear you in the future.